So, uh, well, I was just welcoming all of you. It's very exciting to be here. My name is Giulia Sergi. I co-lead the Ashoka Euro Fellowship Program, which is a co-learning and co-creation um, community for um, our Ashoka Fellows and other change makers um, around Europe to really leverage Ashoka experience, resources, and networks uh, to accelerate change making for the good of all across the continent. Uh, thank you everyone for being here today. This session, as you know, is a refresher on the basic of system change. What is it? We, we hear this word all the time, but what do we actually mean with it? Um, as you know, Ashoka's core mission is that of supporting social entrepreneurs and young change makers to achieve system change in the world, to change the systems that are creating the social problems of our societies. So we have here today with us Alessandro Valera from the Global Impact and Evidence team of Ashoka, who will guide us uh, in understanding what a system is, how it can change, how we can fund its change, and how we can measure system change. Um, we will also hear from the experience towards the end of the session from Rudolf Hilti, co-institutor co and creative chair of the Hus Institute from Liechtenstein. So without further ado, I would uh, now pass the word to Alessandro. Please don't forget to type your questions and insights in the chat uh, throughout the whole session. We will have sp some space for that. Alessandro, over to you. Thank you, Julia, and welcome everyone around the globe. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever um, you are. This is a special uh, session that's a bit different from the other ones. It's um, less uh, participatory, even if you'll have a chance to ask questions, but we thought uh, that as we speak so much about system change, uh, it would be good to offer at least one chance to review what we actually mean, because I think we all have some sort of intuitive understand by um, what we mean, uh, but we don't have it all clear. So uh, thanks for all of you who want to join this uh, refresher. I'm going to share my screen as we have slides. Just a second. There we go. So today is about some system change basics. What are we talking about? How to find money for it and how to measure what you're doing as the three of them, as you'll see, are very much connected. Um, so first of all, just think about a social issue that's very close to you, it's very dear to you or that you are already working um, to solve it. Um, you can tap it in the chat so that everyone can see it. Uh, you can just, just be short, you can say, um, education, inclusion, uh, LGBT rights, uh, envir environment, or you can be more um, specific. What we hope is that uh, what we talk about today will be relevant to each and every issue that uh, you're facing, and then tell us if it's not. So to begin with, just a few words about Ashoka. I think by now you're all uh, familiar, but we are a global organization. We uh, select, uh, support, uh, connect uh, the, the leading social entrepreneurs from around the world. We've done it for 40 years almost and in over 90 countries around uh, the globe. There are a strength and that's where we base a lot of our thinking on. So a lot of what you'll hear today has been based on observing these fellows for 40 years on how they create long lasting um, social impact. So the first message that these fellows have taught us is that scaling a social innovation, it's actually very different from growing a business. Early on in our work, we were tempted to do the same, find the leading social entrepreneurs around the world, give them some money, give them some support so that they could grow their organizations. Actually, a lot of people still think that Ashoka mostly does this and it, it's true we give several of our social entrepreneurs a st living stipend to be able to follow a hundred to, to focus a hundred percent of their times on uh, their new idea but uh, increasingly that uh, we, we suggested that money is not spent on uh, growing their business but on 
scale into system change. Um, so for us, uh, what we ask social entrepreneurs to do and to think about, and many times they do it independently, is to realize how can they bring their innovation from the territories where they have um, prototyped it to everyone, rather than multiplying it town by town, village by village, country by country, can they manage to change the rules for everybody? Or can they manage to make this the new normal so that even people who've never heard of the social entrepreneur or were never lucky enough to live in the same neighborhood as the social entrepreneur will feel the benefit of that change. Now, first of all, what is system change and what is a system beforehand? So, um, Systems are complex uh, and it, they're also hard to define because they can be at many scales. Uh, we can talk about the education system of Spain or we can talk the admission policies of this one school in Spain. Both of them will be um, systems just at different, um, at different scales. Uh, one basic place where to start is this iceberg as um, you can see. Um, problem, social problems and envir environmental problems begin with uh, symptoms that are visible, what we call the tip of the iceberg. And as you know from watching Titanic, even those are hard to, to are easy to miss sometimes, but sooner or later they hit us. So we see poverty, we see homelessness, we see discrimination, we see war. And uh, most of uh, the social work happening in the world aims to put a patch onto these problems. And uh, uh, mind me, this is absolutely necessary and absolutely worth of their praise. Um, what we are uh, saying is that sometimes it's not sufficient to um, solve a problem. Often, uh, these symptoms are the consequence of some root causes that are embedded in a system. The reason why women earn less than men is because of the system that has been put in place to, uh, that was male dominated from the very beginning uh, in, in terms of who gives, who pays for a salary and who receives it. And you can think of it in, um, on, on any other field. And um, beyond this, or underneath this, there's another a second level, what we call frame change, that is mindsets um, shift. Often, the only way to change a system is for people to realize that it's wrong and needs to be changed. And this requires a mindset from at least a few people. So as you can see, there are three levels of action, three levels of change and systems are in the middle of it. So understanding and changing systems is um, crucial to be able to um, better cater to the symptoms, but also to um, change people's mindsets. So um, what is a system? We have studied this in detail for years and we think that the best representation is something called the five R's because fortunately, all the elements we need to talk about uh, start with an R. So let's think about a system as a place in which uh, we have a variety of roles that interact with each other. Think about the education system. You have the role of the teachers, of the head teacher or principal. You have the roles of the students, of the parents, of the ministry of education, of the editors that write the books, of uh, TV, computers, social media, who also help people learn, etc. So these are many different roles. And these uh, obviously are not siloed. These roles are connected by relations or relationships. So uh, there are some structures by which these different players come together or not come together. As you can see in this relation, usually there's one central authority that connects all the dots, but the dots are not always connected to each other. There are also rules. And most of the time when we think about system change, we think about the rules, about the laws governing one um, system or one area. But it's important to think that all these elements have um, a place in system change. Also, when we, th when we think about systems, uh, now I'm, I made examples of public sector uh, areas, the education system, the, uh, the, 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 the environmental protection system. Sometimes 
the private sector can have systems too. We know that there are some companies that hire more people than there are uh, citizens of certain countries. And so changing how a company selects their people, how a company promotes its people, et cetera, can also be a change of rules of a system that's not necessarily a public sector system, but a private one. We also have another R, which are the resources. And so obviously uh, a system is fed by the finances, the money that are behind the system, but also the infrastructures, the people, and we'll look at in details about this in a second. All of these produces results. So the basic idea is that many of us, all of us are part of systems, which seem so hard to change, but change can happen if we plan ahead and get the right coalition of players to change one of those fours, or two of those four, or three of those fours, or maybe all fours. Results can happen. So a li little bit more um, information here, and apologies for the misspelling of framework. Um, when we talk about resources, as we said, we're talking about money, that's the most obvious one, but also about knowledge, about infrastructure, about time, about people. When we talk about um, roles, these are all the interactions that happen between those um, players that we mentioned. These are the, you, you, you see some of the, the, the pictures here. Pictures here try to um, tell us that we can find roles in in not very obvious places. So when we think about education, we may not think about the role that employers have in making certain skills more desirable than others, the roles that textbooks have, et cetera, universities, et cetera. Relations are um, what uh, connects all these different roles. They may happen in person, they may happen online, they may be relations that have been going on for ages or relations that are newer, relations that last for a long time, or relations that just happen quickly because one circumstance that is external to us or one that we created makes it possible. The rules, as we said, are uh, the written or unwritten uh, rules that govern a country, but also remember there are like regional rules, local rules, and uh, rules that uh, for smaller bodies, trade unions, universities, uh, companies, schools, etc. you name it. And as you can see, the results can lead to what we, we, we were expecting, to the opposite of what we were expecting and everything in between. So how does the system change? The system change when we decide to tackle one of more of these change. For example, in this um, visualization, um, a social entrepreneur decides to create a new role and to connect two different players that um, through a new relations that weren't uh, connected before. Let's put this into a bit more context. Let's give an example. This is one of my um, so of the Ashoka fellows that's very dear to me because when I started Ashoka, in Italy six years ago. She was part of the first wave of Ashoka Fellows. We brought in the international community. So Ricarda said that the problem she was trying to solve was the inequality between men and women at work, particularly in large company and particularly after uh, there are, they have children. So what she noticed is that her career was pretty uphill until she had children and everything changed radically when she had children. But when her male colleagues had children, things didn't change so much. So what she thought about at the beginning was to give a response that was, as we saw before, that, she, that, that, that could solve the tip of the iceberg. She created Piano C, Plan C, not to, to show that there's no just Plan A or Plan B, but also Plan C where family and work had come together. This was a co-working space where people, where women uh, could transition from parental leave to work um, by having a kindergarten embedded in the co-working space, shared services, you were free to breastfeed wherever 
uh, it seemed uh, appropriate, etc. It was a space that was welcoming to maternity. Uh, this worked very well in, in, in Milan and, and, and she was asked immediately to develop this model elsewhere, but she realized that she needed so much money and so much time and so much energy and so much capital for this to happen that it would have taken a century before this could spread to every neighborhood in Italy, let alone the rest of the world. So she took a systemic um, a, a, a systemic approach and created maternity as a master, so a mom. Um, and she decided to focus on changing rules and relationship, but to focus on uh, large multinational companies as systems. So she, she switched her focus from direct service to system change. She started working with CEOs and human resources department to make sure that parental leave was seen differently. Is that um, employers start seeing parental leave as a competitive advantage. So the, a time when parents take some time off, just like they would take for a master's that often is offer, offered to professionals in, in large companies, but this time to get new soft skills that are useful to the company. Multitasking, working under uh, stress, uh, building a legacy, teaching others, you name it. All the ones of you who've been, who are parents or who've who are uncles and aunts or who've been with children know what I'm talking about. So by working there, she managed to create a change in, in paradigm and therefore a change of system. At some point, she even tried to change uh, the parental leave um, system in Italy by working with the government to, government to make sure men would have a larger share of parental leave, but she realized that was, that was too complex. So she changed the system of focus from the law governing Italy to the policies governing um, large companies. So I think we can um, stop this first part here and I'm gonna stop sharing and send it back to Julia because I think you might have some questions or comments. Thank you, Alessandro. So, so far there are no questions, just positive comments uh, about a very clear uh, in overview. So just a reminder to everyone to please use the chat to ask any question and, or if you want to try to apply this framework and give an example of, of your own, it's, it's also great. So Alessandro, I think you can continue and then we can have a bit more time at the end for more questions. All right then, let me share my screen again. Let's see if I can do the magic again. There we go. Just give me a second to drink some water. I'm actually using a water bottle from the ACMS last year in Barcelona. So I'm just realizing this water bottle is one year old. <coughs> Let me set my timer, one second, there you go. So this is all very nice. And I'm sure all of you who are social entrepreneurs dream of work in this way. Some of you do, some of you don't, because what's the main problem is that funds out there available for social entrepreneurs, whether you're a nonprofit or you're a social business are very seldom uh, match, a good match for what we're talking about. As we know, most funders what want to fund projects. They have very clear uh, targets, very tangible measures. Uh, would they need to know how many beneficiaries uh, you would attract? And you know that the person with more beneficiaries will get the uh, funds. Um, it's actually in North America and, and in, Italy, in, in Europe to a lesser extent than I think everywhere else. There are websites that tell you how much of the money donated to a charity goes to like evil core costs to people sitting in office as opposed to actually helping the people on the ground. Once again, let me be absolutely clear. We love and we need those people on the ground, but we think that we also need people who work at system level so that foundations CSR companies, government should think about direct service and emergency needs, but should also think and be more open to system change. So how do we do this? Um, not many donors are open, but increasingly so they are. 
So you can begin to say, look, you're not the only one. There's a global shift happening about this. And I think the current crisis where, that we're facing also um, is a good moment to rethink everything, including um, funds. Uh, of course, working at system change level, the, the, the impact you'll create is indirect. It's harder to explain and hard to measure. And there are no pictures to take. We don't have, you know, sometimes when people work for uh, NGOs where you need to take a picture of, you know, a, a turtle in a plastic bag and, and that's it. You, 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 you know what, you, people know what you're talking about. In other cases with system change, it's a lot more difficult. The pictures would be you on Zoom or you running behind members of parliament or you being on Zoom again. And that doesn't make a very good pamphlet for a foundation or a, CR, a CSR program. Um, system change takes time. Clear signs of progress may come later. And giving, let me give you one personal example that when I joined Ashoka in Italy and I recruited um, Julia is one of the first people ever and she's grown so much and I'm incredibly proud of her. But back then we were working on the issue of unemployment and youth unemployment in Italy. And the Bosch Foundation uh, was so generous to give us funds to start Ashoka in Italy uh, for that. And after a year uh, of matching social entrepreneurs from across Europe to the ones in Italy, creating alliances for them to replicate their model and making sure it rippled, we had very little to show as an impact. Uh, so we could say, these many meetings have happened, this event has happened, but I couldn't say, look, we've created millions of jobs. And just last week, Julie and I received an email. Now, neither Julie and I work for Ashoka Italy, but for the global community, we received an email from a person that had been matched with a German fellow six years ago. She had embedded a new system of work. Of work. She had applied for grants. Now, six years later, the results was there, was tangible, but it was in a way too late to share that, um, that, that impact. So if, what you, if what's important to you is impact, we did the right thing, but probably for donors, it would have been a lot more impressive if we had done something right there that year. So it is risky for grantees, and that's why only a few uh, foundations and, 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 and funders embrace this, because the risk of failure is, is there, and impact measure is very unusual. But it's not all bad news. So what are the advice here? Be concrete and honest about the goal. So you have to meet the funders in person. You cannot... Uh, get these funds by clicking online and uh, sending your applications because you're going to need some explanation. You're going to need to build trust. So even if they say that they can't meet people, try to do that. Try to get 15 minutes of their time on Zoom to explain to them what you're doing. Um, be honest about the contribution that you can make and the uncertainties you're already aware of. There's no need to overpromise, overstate and be over overly optimistic. And I've applied for funds for my whole life. So I, I, I can, I, this is based on my experience. I did all of those things. When they tell us what, how many people you're reaching, I'm like, well, well, let's put like a thousand. And then it's like, well, no, if that's not what we're going to do, let's be clear about this because it's better to be clear at the beginning than to disappoint at the end. So how can you build, you can still build credibility with a target system goal plausible strategy and mechanism for continuous learning and adaptation. What does this mean? That these premises that we made, that doesn't mean that you cannot show progress or be credible. You can show them the system you're trying to change. You can show them your system analysis and you can tell them, look, I'm going to pursue two different strategies a year or whatever it is. And this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to continuous learn and continuously learn and adapt to um, my strategy as I continue. So very important, you should keep the donors and every stakeholders updated th throughout the process, even if they don't ask, because the current system, they just wait for a big fat report at the end with all the data and you may not have that. So it's important to reach out to them with information and updating them on what's going on, what you think it's working, what you think it's not working, especially if what you've put in the initial application is changing. And that can change. There are so many factors that can change. 
you can think about milestones that are achievable throughout the process, even if you don't have clear numbers of beneficiaries. For example, you can tell, I'm going to meet 20 members of parliament a month until I get to 200. And that your impact report can be, I've met 12 this week, uh, seven next week, etc. You can tell them, I'm going to write articles on every magazine that's read by who, whatever is your target with this. And then every time you write an article, you send it to them. And that's how you uh, prove the, 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 your, your milestones. So one final uh, advice, and it's written in, in, in bold because some of our social entrepreneurs actually experience this as firsthand. Open source, share and train. As you do this, don't feel you have to hide yourself in the secrecy of a lobbyist. You're doing this to create impact and probably many more wish they were doing the same, have advice, can help you. So your thirst for collaboration can actually become a marketing tool for unlikely collaboration. Who knows who may be interested in this and helping you? Who knows whether you, many other people will want to do the same and you can train them and get a bit of money with that on top of your help. This is a good marketing uh, strategy. And at the same time, it's also a good way for you to be seen as the leader of system change. So blog if you blog, use social media if you use social media, use them smart and you build the community that actually helps you to reach your systems. And you actually create those uh, roles and relationships that we saw before in the system. So how to measure it? This gets increasingly complex, but let's give it a try. So, oh, now we can see the iceberg rotating. That's beautiful. Oh, it's just stopped. Um, where and how to measure impact. So let's go back to the visible consequences of, um, uh, of a social problem. Uh, and even as social entrepreneurs, and I speak from experience, even within the Ashoka world, I, I noticed until a couple of years ago when uh, together with uh, Diana Wells, we started a, a new unit at Ashoka taking care of impact and measurement, we realized that 90% of our impact evaluation questions uh, usually fell in this top tier. Did you like our workshop? Was that long enough? Was it so short? Was the material clear? Did you enjoy this? Did you like that? This is all very important, but let's remember it's just one of the aspects of uh, the experience. And actually even within the visible part, there's an aspect of customer satisfaction, which is okay to collect data on, but there's also an impact on the beneficiaries themselves. Did, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, if I'm giving uh, healthcare counseling to young women, was this useful to you? Are you using contraceptive? Whatever it is that, um, that we are doing. Very important, 90% of the measurement in our field fall here. What we suggest is that you consider also measuring impact at uh, other levels. In terms of system change, the impact can be measured internally or externally. And I think this is an important point. Uh, as we said earlier, systems are not just the education system of India or the procurement uh, of the state of Alabama. Uh, sometimes the internal impact is on the funder uh, or partner itself. So funders sometimes uh, react very unexpectedly to this, but if you're working, for example, say with a foundation, the impact would also be that this foundation at the end of it changes how they finance other social entrepreneurs or what kind of reporting standards they require. And same with a company, I will see it on in a second. Or it can also be external on the actual system. This is actually the most common. And as we said before, ultimately we want to change systems so that people start thinking differently too and start acting differently. And those two things can also be measured. And we'll see in a second how. This will be very brief, but uh, we have material on all of this if you wish to read uh, more. And there's a specific session here on Swap Card. Uh, called the Learning and Action Center, where another area of Ashoka where I work for, when you can find detailed readings about all of this. So let's start with um, taking one step back. 
in a way, all impact evaluations and measurements are ultimately about success. So when we talk about impact evaluation, we're talking about what if everything worked in the best possible way, what would success look like? And that's a good starting point because then we can build back backwards where we every step we need to take to agree to that success. So for us, the goal for most social entrepreneurs and definitely the one in our network is not to build partnership to raise money for activities. Not at least not in, in, in the medium and long term, but to engage partners in changing their views and systems. So they become part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And one of the most, re, com, most common reasons behind low renewal rate of partnership is a mismatch, mismatch of expectations. So to me, success is system changing entrepreneurs. To the partner is a number of jobs created. If we leave that to the very end of the partnership, it's going to be trouble. So discuss with your partner a shared vision of what success may look like from the very beginning, and then transform this vision of success into tangible and measurement accounts. So how did this look like for us? For Ashoka, we realized earlier on that success depends on idea spread, not on increasing the number of direct beneficiaries. And I remember when I was looking for the top social entrepreneurs in Italy, one of them told me, well, what if, what if, what if they steal my idea? And I was like, well, if they steal your idea, that's great. It, that, that's idea spread. That means it, your idea is so good that others want to do it and you should be proud, whether or not it has your name underneath. Then I know that we have intellectual property, et cetera, but we're talking uh, macro here. Um, so for us, how we decided to measure our own impact, consider that we work with fellows in, in very different uh, areas. And for some of them, success is the number of birds uh, that they find home in a forest for others is how well children do in school. We, we couldn't possibly find one measure that was the same for all of them unless we went, we, we, we looked for measures of system success. For example, the independent replication of ideas that I've just told you about, changes in market system, changes in policy or um, legislation. Uh, and, and we'll have a look about uh, soon about what that means. The number of partnerships that can be created with diverse stakeholders. Have you, have you done the usual partners with three other NGOs or were you able to recruit schools, universities, unions, government bodies, religious groups? Uh, for us, success is the, the amount of awards received, meaning that others find the same view of success as we do. It's also, and this is what Ashoka has done in the second part of its life in the last 15, 20 years or so, it's about putting young people in charge. It's about your legacy. And it's creating new roles for others to be change makers. What we find consistently across all of our social network, uh, uh, for social entrepreneurs, is that almost nobody sees their work as providing a service to beneficiaries as uh, passive recipients of a service. Most of them, and actually all of them, I would say, work hard to make, to foster change making and to create other change makers. So that's what success looks for us. But now about system change. Remember that I said that system change can be on a part on a partner itself. So for example, if we talk about um, a company, sorry, um, as mentioned before, if, for example, if a company gives you money to work on the field of disability, and then they have awful, uh, it's, it's an awful working environment for people with disability, and it's not a random example, because we, we all know that it happens uh, more often than we would like, the system change could, could, would actually be to get that company to rethink how they hire people, uh, what policy of inclusion they have, uh, what kind of infrastructure they have, whether the buildings are accessible, what websites they recruit from, whether the recruitment uh, material they send out is um, available uh, with people who can for people who can't see or can't hear, etc. And um, try it. it. It's fun. Their first reaction when they ask you for your measurement and you tell them that the measurement is them. Um, they react from awkward to um, disbelief, uh, but most of the time they um, come on board with it. And you can also tell them like, look, 
maybe you want to look for something else and we're absolutely fine, but can we also monitor this? And if you're not interested, we'll just keep it for ourselves, but, um, and, and we'll for sure look for the measurements that are on your list, but let us do this too. And most of the time this works. Um, and it creates changes, changes that live beyond you, right? If, if the partnership with Ashoka ends and the person who does uh, recruitment changes job in a year, what you have created will stay, which is difficult to say for other um, projects. Same if you work for a foundations. As we said earlier on, it's foundations are, need urgently to change how they give money and how they monitor results and how um, they, 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 they think about their role in general as active players rather than people who give money and then a year later want to look for a report. And changing how they work and telling them that throughout this report you want them to change their system is also a good way of, of achieving system change. And you can also do that with a partner, meaning a non-financial partner, someone who works with you, that you brought in your partnership because they were real experts on whatever issue you are, you're, you're focusing on. Say that you're working with uh, women of color and you're uh, very good with women, but you brought in a partner that specifically works with women of color. Well, then if this new smaller um, partner that comes with you, that, that comes along with your partnership, also sees some of the systemic um, and, 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 and mindset change that we talked about, that can be considered as system change because it's likely to stay. What about the system itself? This is where it, it's, a lot most, it's a lot more common, but I wanted to also uh, talk about the previous opportunity. The way we suggest to go about it is you, can, you should map and define your system, including its five R's. And Ashoka has hundreds of resources on this and you can do it online and it takes time. This is something you do in weeks, not in hours. Uh, you take your time to understand who are all the players, how they relate among themselves, who talks to whom, uh, what institutions are there, what roles are, um, are there and what roles are not. And once you've done that, you can plan your system change or which means I'm going to change the rules of this system or I'm going to try to create a new role. Think about the Ministry of Equal Opportunities. The, the ministry didn't exist until 20, 30 years ago. So the creation of a new role actually in itself created and led in the future to the creation of a lot of um, impact. So you, you, you plan your system change journey. And then while knowing that a lot could change, um, but with that, then you go ahead and you start and you do, and you find ways to measure progress throughout. And we see how now. So for example, these are some measures that we use at Ashoka to measure uh, change in the public sector based on the five R's. So we see how many of our fellows have achieved legislative change or influence government policy at the international, national and local level. Whether they've provided missing data or research. We have a lot of entrepreneurs that work with data. We heard on some of them today. By giving this data, you allow the policymakers who are on your side to push for uh, changes more uh, with more evidence. Or you may even bring some of the uh, the ones who are not on your side. So even if it's not you directly uh, leading to policy change, your data will, your research will. Um, obviously, a lot of them sit in bodies ex as uh, as experts, and that, that, that's obviously a way to affect system change. Uh, they represent marginalized population or challenge them in course. We have a fellow, Flaviano Bianchini, for example, who does that. He works with communities around Latin America and uh, beyond where uh, people don't have the means to collect evidence on pollutions of rivers, for example. And he has, he's, he has a background in chemistry and biology with other people. They go there, they measure it, they provide all the evidence to achieve change through courts. So sometimes it doesn't have to be a new law, but the implementation of a law through courts. And as we talk about resources, sometimes convincing government to allocate funds to a specific cause that had no uh, funds before is actually a measure 
of systems change. So these are all things that you can track in your system change um, journey. What about when our focus is not on policy, but on uh, market? As we know, the social entrepreneurs are also very active in this um, field. As you can see, you can increase the flow of market information. You can make it easier for people to trade or access certain goods, create a new market, provide new ways to generate income, lead change to the code of conduct or official policy of a large organization or industry. This is, we talked about this. Uh, earlier, and also to include previously excluded people. So um, before going to mindset shift, one more thought. So measuring system change is possible, is not um, obvious, but it can, be, it, it, it can be done. And remember, it's about your milestones, it's about what you um, define as important, and it's about negoti negotiating this earlier on with the funders. Final level, remember this is not strictly on system change, but I think it's important. And uh, it, it is, it's the third, the third level of mindset um, shift, which is fundamental because we know that sometimes even if we change the law, uh, uh, this may not be sufficient. And let me give you an example here. Uh, Brazil is one of the countries in the world with the best legislation for people who want to change uh, gender. So it's, it's fairly easy to change your, the gender that was assigned to you at birth if you, you realize that that's not the gender that represents you. It's also the capital of murder of trans people in the world with hundreds murdered uh, in the world, sadly. So the change in legislation did not completely funnel uh, a change in, in, in mindset. And there's more work required there for people to also change um, how they how they think, and um, in a way, we do need people to we need we need a few people to start changing their mindset to be able to achieve system change, which often leads to more people changing their mindsets. And I've, I've chosen two civil rights examples uh, here. So if I have one more minute, I'll, I'll give you this example and then close. Think about the votes for women. It's only 125 years ago when this was experimented for the first time. And then in 1895 in New Zealand, enough men, because back then it was up to them to decide, were convinced that women could be given a chance to vote. And when they saw that this only led to positive change, uh, so more people changed their mindset as a consequence of system change. And soon after, one country, two countries, seven countries, 10 countries changed that so that by 1945, in half of the world, you could, women could vote. And by now, they can do it in every country in the world except for two. Then, whether or not they're free and fair election is it's a, separate, um, it's a separate issue. And up to the point that my colleague Enrica, um, the last time she went voting a couple of months ago, she took her daughter, who's eight year old, there. And as she went voting, she told her, oh, this is very important. You know, women could not vote at some point. And this, the daughter was shocked. She was like, what, why? She just couldn't believe, she couldn't conceive it. She didn't have a mindset that could even explain that. So the mindset shift had happened 125 years later to people not even able to conceive this. And you can see it happening a lot faster with um, same-sex marriage, which only came into existence this century in 2001. And I think we're half a way through that change, that half of the world is there and half of the world is not. And as soon as, change, as gay marriage is approved somewhere, within three or four years later, the number of people who approve it is skyrockets, up to the point that now a majority of Republicans in America who opposed it only like five years ago are in favor. How do you measure this? Well, the best way to measure attitudes and behaviors are with pre and post data collection. So, and a mix with quantitative and qualitative. So numbers and percentages, but also interviews. And usually you should talk to people before you start an intervention with them or before your system change uh, kicks in and afterwards and see whether, whether change happens. This is a very complex matter. I'm not gonna get into it now because in social sciences, causation is always tricky to prove. So it's hard to prove that your work has led to that change also because the world is complex and it's probably not just your work, but a variety of factors. But anyways, you can at least suggest 
that the two are correlated so that the more your work happens, the more it will lead to this result. So I'm gonna stop here. Thank you very much for listening and back to you, Julia. Thank you so much, Alessandro. This was really insightful. Um, in, in this last 10 minutes that we have left, I would like to introduce to this virtual stage, uh, Rudolf Hilti. And I will actually use some of the questions and comments that came from the chat to, uh, to pass the word uh, to you, Rudy. Um, Rudy Hilti is from Liechtenstein, and it was really funny in our preparation. Um, he actually shared this as a metaphor of, of how starting, of how you can start even very small and still achieve great, great change. Uh, Liechtenstein is, is a country that is the, the size of a village. So uh, to introduce you, Rudy, I, I would love, I mean, I would love for you to introduce yourself and share how even coming from, from this small country, you can, you achieved everything that you achieved and, and how it's, so everyone can really start small to, to go big. Um, Rudy is a, a real passionate um, advocate of system change. He includes this mindset into everything he does, he, into his work as an entrepreneur, also as an impact investor, and as the founder of the System Change Foundation, which is also um, one of the foundations that supported this summit. So thank you so much, Rudy, for, for your contribution and making this summit happen. And you also founded the Who's in Liechtenstein, which is a, a real and virtual meeting house of like-minded people and institutions. Um, and you also set up um, a, a world systemic forum every year. So really system change is your, your bread and butter, I would say. So while you introduce yourself, Rudy, I, I would love to also pass to you some of the questions from, from the chat. And mainly there are two, there is a long debate going on in the chat. I really loved reading it. And one of them is really about the difference between system change and mindset shift. Um, what is this different and what should social entrepreneurs approach first or are they, uh, do they happen at the same time? So if you can deep dive a little bit in that. And then another question is more from, from the founder's perspective. If you have any advice on how we can convince uh, investors to fund system change initiatives and maybe even applying a, a return logic to them. And in general, if, you know, if they're very used to being um, used to quick fixes, how do you change their mind a little bit to move towards uh, systemic change? So um, Rudy, I, I would pass the word to you and then we have a small video to, to close your session as, as a gift to the participants. But first to you, please. So hi, thank you. Yeah, to the first question, I think system change, it's more than just a mindset. It's, uh, I, we always speak about three, three things. It's about technology, it's about policy, and it's about behavior. Um, and technology is by far the easiest part of it, but everyone usually sp speaks about it. Um, and for sure, technology needs a lot of capital that you can make it ready. But the other important things are as well, policy and behavior and policy that needs trustful relationships. And in this world, I think we created so much data, but it, it's amazing because we created it to use it, but we need a different framework, how we use things. And then the last part behavior, I think that's the most important thing and it needs us all. It's not that some uh, investors or some companies can change it. It needs a different understanding. It, it's, it needs a different uh, common sense. And it's, I think as well, what Ashoka is doing, it needs change makers. Um, and social entrepreneurs and people who go ahead and shows different directions. And it's, you can compare it sometimes like in, at, with a, at the boat, the trimming trap, it's a small thing, but it gives the direction. And, and so you can have something, a small thing can have big impact and that we should be aware of. And everyone can be a change maker. Everyone can be a storyteller and, and stories are important for do that. And you have to, uh, um, you have to communicate with 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 uh, with uh, with a story that you can bring people out along with you. 
So mindset is important. So you cannot say what is more important, what is, so there are different things. So it's technology, it's behavior and it's policy and we need all together. So mindset is definitely a super important thing of it. Um, the second question, how to convince investors. I think that's a really, really important thing because to make system change real, we have to create new markets. We need a new understanding and for sure we have to think big, but more important, we have to think different and to think different. That's a really hard thing because usually if you talk about system change, it's too complex. It's too far away. It's, 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 it's really hard to imagine a, a different future, but that's what you have to do because we are not in the industrial age anymore. We're in the digital modern era and, and they're completely different systems. And to, to, to get the new, you have, it's easier sometimes to forget the old. It's not that you can adapt it. Sometimes you radically change it. And, but you only will do it if you see, uh, if you see the potential of the future. And what we say is sometimes as well, uh, uh, how can I say it's not so, it can, it can be dangerous if you have too many experienced people at the table, you have to mix it and you have to see the new as well. And now we are coming to how to, uh, to, to get investors for uh, a track to your, uh, to your idea. You have to see a different future. You have to see in this world or today, the price is not the value in future. I believe in it and I will do everything that it will be the case that we pay the real price. And this is with the, with the costs we create. And then you can see as well, there, there are huge opportunities, opportunities to invest. At the same time, people are changing their behavior. So we are changing our, what, 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 has, what has a story? Or for, for example, in Italy, it's all about branding. But how can luxury products or in future, if you go in, in the future, I think every luxury product has to be sustainable. Otherwise it cannot be a luxury good. So it's, it's in our mindset again. And if you create now a story for your project is you look, this is the new big thing in, in the future. This is something people are ready to pay more. This is because we are creating something which are people are looking for because they're changing their mindset because of these new stories of, because of this new uh, culture, what we create of this new information, because in the future we ha will have more transparency and that's important because with this, we create a different story. We cannot, we cannot fake the, uh, the consumption or products. We cannot make them nice than they are. So we, we will tell the, uh, the, the true the truth about it. So, so you can convince investors by just telling them, look, I create the future. It's, it's a different market. Or you can make a market out of it. For example, for carbon, I really believe the carbon market will be the same size like the oil market in the, in the next coming years. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you very much. Um, Alessandra, I was wondering if you also would like to uh, answer the, the big burning question about the difference between system change and mindset shift and which one comes first. Yeah, thank you. I mean, this is a chicken and egg question. And the beauty of it is that we're not alone. We don't have to do everything. So as long as there are other people in the ecosystem to do what we don't do, um, the, 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 there will be the magic of social changes. You needed people to provide uh, shelters for LGBT kids who were kicked out from their homes because so you needed the direct service. You needed pe people to uh, pushing for gender equality, and you needed Almodovar making movies uh, about queer people and normalizing them as part of Spanish society and therefore global society. Those people probably didn't know about each other, and we have the luxury now to. Um, be more connected, be able to work better in teams, etc. Don't take upon yourself the burden of everything, but the system mapping can also help you to do this, to see where the gaps are. If you already have 15 organizations which are 
do beautiful work on Instagram and uh, in, in terms of comms, well, then maybe think about lobbying the government instead. Uh, if on the other hand, everyone is already well catered to do lobbying, uh, do the comms. If they're both great, focus on uh, local government rather than national government, etc. So because you do need both. Take the women's suffrage. You needed the American suffrage for someone in New Zealand to make it because that actually um, came, for, came, came first chronologically but the result rippled somewhere else because the opportunity of your work now may actually result in success somewhere else before you get it at home. And that's okay. We're all on the, on the same boat. It's just, I think the main, if you, if you need to keep one thought from today is that you, you, you don't need to touch all buttons. You, need, you don't need to have impact at all six levels, you know, the, 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 the three levels and there were two differences in each one of them, but do not automatically go for number one. Think of all six and then see which one applies to you, which one you can, you can make a difference in, which one you can't, and only then focus on one, knowing that you couldn't do the other ones, rather than going using direct service as a default. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you for these closing remarks. Um, so we are at the end of this session. Thank you so much, Rudolf Hilti and Alessandro Valera. Thank you all of you for, for being here and following us. I just wanted to give a small reminder uh, to visit the Ashoka booth uh, at the, in the exhibition center of Swapcard where you see all the different ways you can, you can get engaged. And also if you want to visit the um, Fellowship Europe program page that I mentioned at the beginning, we actually have a course, a module specifically on system change and I just pasted in the chat uh, where you can find more information. Thank you for being here. Um, it's, it's crucial that we keep our system change work. The world is really demanding for it. There is raising demand for systemic initiatives. So please, if you're a social entrepreneur, focus on system change if you can. If you're a founder, support system changing initiatives. Um, thank you everyone again for being here and looking forward to seeing you in the next.